This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 655 of the Dressage Radio Show, official podcast of the United States Dressage Federation on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products and Total Saddle Fit. On today's show, we will be joined by veterinarian Dr. Carol Holland talking about determining if your horse has neck and or back pain. Followed by judge and rider Louise Denizard discussing different rein holding techniques. And then Lauren Spicer gives us a great trainer tip of the week. This is Reese Koffler Stanfield from Loxahatchee, Florida. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Well, hi, Phil. How are you? Uh, Less cold, I think, this week. Uh, Otherwise, doing good. Just uh, plugging along. How how are things in uh, in Welly World? Welly World, busy. Busy. (laughs) It was actually kind of rainy and cold this week for here. Uh, if you, the, there's a CDI going on this week and they, they jogged them in the rain. I mean, it, and it was raining. So I'm surprised they I didn't back pictures, it up. Yeah. People yeah, are getting they, wet and you know, all those great things and yeah, you know, <laughs> it's a sport done in the outdoors and you guys are in yeah. Florida. So I feel, you know, no sympathy for anyone having to yeah. ride in the rain. I know, but you have some really big news and I want to congratulate you because this is such a big deal. You announced this week that you became an Equine Canada certified coach. Congratulations, my friend. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I kind of adopted this, you know, I started it uh, right before the, uh, you know, it was, it was January or February 2020 when I started on this, uh, this journey, which it has been. Um, but it's been a nice uh, pandemic project. You know, there are a lot of online courses and actually, February 2020 is when I did, uh, they have in-person courses, which have switched to online now. So I was in school for a little bit and, you know, doing all the, all the prerequisites and putting together my coaching package to be submitted. And then, so finally this last weekend, I had, I finished the last part of my evaluation, which was the practical teaching, which I, you know, was teaching a few lessons you know, over the morning with a couple of evaluators and uh, early in the week, they had uh, said that I had passed everything and uh, emailed me my certification thing. And so I took down Meredith's DVM and I put up my uh, coaching <laughs> certification thing. And uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I'm, I'm really glad I you know got it done. So what's happening in Canada is they're actually working towards making this mandatory to be able to coach at EC competition or an FEI competition, they will be starting to check credentials very soon. So uh, sooner or later, I had to I had to do it, and and uh, I'm now glad that uh, that I did it. You know, got in there and I, got it done. Seriously, so proud of you. I think it, it, it's one of those things you don't realize how difficult it is until you start doing it, and it is a very very difficult process. So seriously, my friend, congratulations. It's well, the, it's the, a yeah, big I deal. think that the 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 issue was is that you know if I had started the process when I was younger uh, and just done it like you know you do this, you do this, you know you know you, do, you start to check some things off of that list in, in which you think you're going to be a coach that's fine. But, uh, I gone this long just coaching without getting it, um, that I, that I had to like jump in and do all of the things, uh, all the way through. So that, that was where, that was where the problem was is like, I didn't do it, didn't do it, didn't do it. And then, then I'm just like, okay, I'm going to have to do it. So now I have to do it. Well, so that I, I have think- to start from the beginning and, and go yeah. all the way up to my current level. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's a really good thing. Just if anybody's listening, that's a young professional, go through the certification. Um, yeah, just start on the process start it. Yeah, early yep. and get some some of the things done. Um, uh, in Canada, it's a bit of a process. It's, it's run in conjunction with the um, NCCP, which is the National Coaching Certification Program, which is for all sports. So it's not it's not just 
the the horse thing i had to do some education as far as like learning how people learn and like things that apply you know the different development stages of of people as they are growing up and you know whatever you know does, doesn't matter what what you're coaching you have to kind of do these prerequisites before you can go specifically to coaching equestrian or coaching swimming or or whatever so that's all it's all tied in together and all part of it so there's yeah that is was, super cool yeah we ours is a little bit different right we i mean we all have to take safe sport and that kind of thing um but it, it's a different program uh, that's super cool I'm, I'm so proud of you and everybody i didn't know either i was a little hurt I didn't even know Phil was doing this. It was so cool. I was so excited when I saw his announcement this week. It was yeah, really cool. So now um, they've, they've got different levels of coaches. Uh, it's different than, you know, it's different than the American system. But ours are kind of based on teaching. I don't know. It's it's hard to describe. So the first level is uh, it's called an instructor, which you would be teaching kids how to coach and, or you'd be co- coaching more, uh, you know, lower level stuff safety is a big aspect so uh you know then the next level up is competitions coach so you would be uh you know that level of coach would be coaching people in the beginning of them participating in competitions and then the next level is competition coach specialist and that's where you start to specialize so uh, you know i've 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 only got my dressage certification for that level so they they specialize in eventing uh western there, there's all the specializations and then the next step above me is called high performance and that's for coaches um who are you know would have students going to young riders or olympic games or you know like the yeah there's a lot more to a high performance coach um, than even what I've got. And I've got a more than, you know, what the competition coach is. So it's, there's a lot of these, uh, national coaching certification, um, elements that are brought in, you know, like education on, on nutrition, education on designing, a. they've got a section that's called designing a sport program. So you would be taking somebody through an entire competition year and designing a program for the whole year of, I know develop skill development versus, you know, um, technical practice or, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of weird stuff. So, you know, I think I'm going to continue on it, but it would be a lot more courses and, 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 and that kind of thing. But again, if I get my high performance, then it would allow me to be a chef to keep for a team or, or something like that. So, well, I'm super proud of you. That's a huge deal. My friend, congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a bit difficult to navigate, but it's just doing one thing, one one step at a time, right? It's the same as horse training. You can only do one thing a day, and so I just did a little bit of of something every day or every week, and eventually it was all done. Well, exactly. Only two <laughs> years, but I'm so proud of you. <laughs> no, it's a big deal, and, and and truly, everyone, if if you you're working with people, um, try to encourage them to go for the certification because I, I I'm I'm with Phil. I think it will. In the states too, it eventually will become mandatory. So I think, it, and it, it probably should. So uh, definitely encourage everyone to move forward. It's hard for coaches because we're working, we're trying to make a living, and then you have to go home and do classes, and it's a big deal. So yeah, and, and spend and spend that money. I mean, the money. it was like you've got to spend the money, you know, to to take the courses, and it seemed like each step was, oh, you just want, you know, and and you have to pay to be evaluated, and you have to pay, you know, there was a lot of. Um, it's a financial commitment, but, uh, I think in, uh, dressage, we talk about this a lot. We've, we've got to raise the standard of, of who is out there teaching. And, and so, you know, it's hypocritical to, to not get certified. That's the way I was feeling anyways. Well, I'm proud of you. Good. Really good job. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad. Very good. Like you said, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. So yay, Phil. <laughs> drum roll. Very, very proud of you. Well, Phil, we're going to bring your new coaching. We well, always have had amazing coaching abilities, but um, after this commercial break, we're going to get into the program and we think we have a good one for you. So we hope you all enjoy. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. If you've ever had a horse with diarrhea, you know what a frustrating problem it can be. 
Finding an ingredient that works to dry up the diarrhea becomes a high priority. It turns out that researchers have found one, a yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii. It has been proven to improve and halt episodes of diarrhea. It supplies specific nutrients to the lining of the small and large intestines, and these nutrients promote healing of irritated tissues. It also supports improved starch and sugar digestion in the small intestine, reducing the opportunity for imbalances to occur in the hindgut. Nalox Advanced, made by Kentucky Performance Products, contains Saccharomyces boulardii, along with a blend of fermentation solubles and stomach buffers. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of any age that are suffering from diarrhea. It also supports a healthy digestive tract in horses at risk for gastric or colonic ulcers, such as performance horses or any horse that is constantly on the go and exposed to stressful situations. For best results, Nalox Advanced should be fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Well, tonight, I am so happy to have Dr. Carol Holland of Natural Vet Palm Beach on the show. Welcome, Dr. Holland. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking me. Well, full disclosure, you have been my vet. I don't even remember how many years. And so I adore you. I adore what you do with my, with my horses. Um, you're just such a great addition to my program. So we'll tell everybody right away. But we were chatting yesterday about necks and sort of the biomechanics of necks and backs and how that has sort of changed even in the last like five years. I think we've learned so much more. So I said, do you mind to come back on the podcast? You've come on once before. And, and I said, do you want to come back on and, and talk about it? So I'm going to hand it over to you to, to get started with that. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure and a privilege. And I really appreciate it as, as well as getting to know you in the past few years. But um, one of the things that I'm constantly asked about is neck and, and um, injections of necks. Does my horse's back hurt? And, and really, how is the best way to evaluate it? In my practice, I use integrative medicine. It's sort of the new buzzword with veterinarians. Um, there's conventional medicine, which is regular veterinarian, call them out for a colic, you know, x-rays, whatever you have. And there's alternative medicine, which is, you know, only acupuncture or chiropractic or um, any of the uh, modalities that go with that. So the veterinarians that um, do both, a lot of times we're sort of coining the term in integrative medicine. So what we do is a diagnosis and exam based on both of the modalities with from acupuncture or alternative medicine and then conventional medicine. And then the most exciting thing that I've known in the past few years is the advent of advanced imaging which is ultrasound and digital x-rays. Because when I graduated from vet school from the University of Georgia many, many, many years ago, we dipped our films in buckets. And at least we don't have to do that anymore. And we can we can actually see the radiographs instantly and see where the um, the bone issues might be um, on the, the neck. Or the, yeah, change the contrast. Do, do wonderful things in the stall, beside the stall, you know, in the barn right there. Also, as in, as imaging has advanced and ultrasounds have become portable and very small and everybody has one, we do imaging of the neck and we do imaging of the back. And the best thing we can tell with that kind of imaging is the soft tissue part of the joints and the soft tissue part of the muscles and the tendons and even down to the nerve roots that come out of the, the vertebra. So... With all that exciting information, what you know? How do you know what to do? How do you know if your horse even has neck and back pain? And I get asked that question all the time, and that comes with part of the exam. So one of my things that I tell everybody is that you know back pain can be caused by the back, and that's muscles, bones, and nerves, and it can be caused by riders. It can be caused by um, injuries to the actual back or, or problems within the back of genetic injuries of OCD, anything like that. It can also be caused by organ pain. So 
so everybody always thinks of the mare that has ovary pain and she starts kicking and that's what causes her back to have pain or most commonly stomach pain from, you know, gastric ulcers or colon inflammation. And that can also cause severe back pain. And you don't ever think about that, but that is very common. And we're seeing more and more of that all the time. The third reason horses can have back problems is because of their lower limbs and lameness. And the lameness can be caused by anything, of course, just like lameness anywhere. So when we got out of when I got out of vet school a hundred years ago, we never even thought about necks and backs, and and it was not even taught as part of the lameness exam. But now you know it's either a compensation or because of the advanced imaging, we can tell if there's a problem right away. So one of my favorite things to talk to people about is when you have a back problem. Don't forget that the muscles in the back that the rider actually sits on connect all the way forward to the fourth cervical vertebra in the neck. And the fourth cervical vertebra is midway down. So when a horse turns his head to look and to advance or to use his body, he's turning that location. So when you're sitting on him, if he has any neck pain right there, that can aggravate that also. So because of the biomechanics of the spine, You have to consider that it's very easy for your horse to have pain in these locations and they won't show lameness, but they can show behavior problems or um, in advanced cases, lameness. It's it's not wonderful to have lameness from back or neck. So as integrative doctors, one of the ways we can do this is use acupuncture as um, a diagnostic technique to find out exactly where the pain is. And then we can go use chiropractic to do adjustments on the neck and the back. And if that is not responding and it's not a conservative type therapy that's desired, it was more of an instant, we have to fix this horse for the show this Friday and it's Wednesday, Um, you can't do things like injections, but say it's a month away, then we go into looking into injections into the actual joints of the vertebra. So that's kind of a rambling talk about, you know, where do you go from all this and how do you know it? And... Um, it's for me something I do um, every single solitary day here in Wellington and wherever I travel is to always make sure I check the neck and back. And I know there's a lot of questions um, rambling through everybody's mind about what do I do once it's there? Like, how do I fix it? And I personally think it's an individual thing amongst each horse because um, it's not always a lameness. So does your horse really need his neck? injected or do you do you really need to do chiropractic or do you really need to do therapy on it and is it going to get better with the lower leg lameness and that is when you start to call your veterinarian and you have a long discussion and you do a performance evaluation with the horse and the rider I think neck evaluations have to be done neck and back pretty much have to be done with a rider so uh, for me, it, it as I said, it's a daily a daily occurrence. And um, if you have not forgotten about the saddle and the bridle as part of the um, equation and pain, that's also a part of it. But um, certainly, that's easily checked. And with everybody's riders, our, our saddle companies coming out pretty regular. Um, that can also be a, a mitigating factor with a horse that has an underlying bone spur in its back or underlying muscle pain. So um, to give you that intro, I wonder if anybody, if you have any questions, Reese, if I've answered anything that you might have already wanted for, to know for about. For sure. So, so many questions. Um, and, and we've worked together <laughs> so we, we, with, yeah. with neck and back pain before. So um, mm-hmm. I, I, some of my questions, and, and I think one of the biggest ones that I've seen, and, and because it's happened to me a couple times now, was how the stomach ulcers affected the back. That, that was a big thing. I had a couple horses that really struggled with some stomach issues last season, and we worked a lot on that. And, and one of the things that we did was change some diets. And it sounds kind of silly, but we, we had one horse specifically who really, we changed, he looked great, but he was not good in his stomach and we changed his diet and it changed his entire life actually, because of how the stomach ulcers were affecting the back 
And I never put that together. That was never something that I was thinking. And, and that was that was a big one. But my my next question is kissing spine. I think everyone, you know, I at least you know, five years ago or so, taking x-rays um and a pre-purchase was not done as much, right? So now we're getting all this information on the imaging. And can you talk a little bit about kissing spine? Because I know a lot, there's a lot of things swirling around with that. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting thing that horses can have because of the anatomy, number one, and because every horse has its own specific back shape. And we all know the different type of back shapes where a horse might have a sway back or a curve in the back, and that's called um, kyphosis. And then you're wondering like, where is, are the vertebra in relation to all this? Well, some horses are naturally born with the vertebra that actually touch. And, and then if they, the top of the vertebra, those are called dorsal spinous processes. And on my Instagram, which I'll give you that later, you guys can go later and look at pictures. I put some anatomy pictures on. And if you like to look at that, you can see the dorsal spinous process. That's the part of the vertebra that sticks up. And it's the part you sit on. And when you sit on top of those, the spine like that, if a horse has a weak back and it has a propensity like a curvature that goes down, then those spine, the spinal processes can rub. That's the, the most, most uh, not severe case. Severe cases, what happens is the vertebra actually cross over each other or the bones have rubbed together so much that the bones have started to erode and then there's bone spurs and, and every variation of bone degradation that follows that. So the, when it the, talks about kissing spines, we take an x-ray image from the side. It would be like looking at the side of your barn and looking at the posts that hold up your barn and where they are in relation to each other. So each vertebral process that, that sticks straight up, the dorsal spine process, if it touches the one in front of it or behind, that's mild. If you see bony changes, that would be the next level. And if you see what's called overriding spinous processes, where you can't see between them or the two spinous processes are completely touching and, and overlapping, that's pretty severe. So your next question is, is you know, what do we do and, and can I buy a horse that has this or what if my horse that has this? So what I tell everybody is first, take the x-ray and then see if the horse has pain related to this. If there's pain related to it, then that's, that's an even worse case. Some horses can have certain types of spinal um, abnormalities where they never have any pain related to it at all, which is kind of weird because everybody's so scared of kissing spines. So if you take the x-ray and you don't find any pain and you see the bones rubbing, what you can say as a prediction for the future is if the horse's back muscles become weak or he has back pain from one of the three reasons that I mentioned earlier, that might lend him to have a more severe reaction if the spine is touching. It's very challenging to have a horse if they are true kissing spines or dorsal overriding spines to not have back pain. And so once they start to rub each other or once they start to crisscross over the top, then that's a challenging thing to um, repair as a veterinarian. It can be done, but it certainly is not the end of the world. I've seen plenty of horses that can compete with it, but not without therapy. So I hope that answered for the kissing spines. <laughs> well, isn't it, I'm sorry, um, you know, you can have veterinary therapy, but you can also you know, what we're trying to do as dressage riders and trainers is encourage the horse to lift their spines and, and move um, more, more correctly. And I think it's really up to the to the owners or the riders to be, you know, encouraging that in, in daily work. Certainly is. And, and the more encouragement and the more strength that is provided for the horse to lift his own back without pain, that can prevent any type of back problem anyway. That can help a dorsal overriding spine. It can help kissing spine. And it can also help just, um, you know, where they, they barely touch but don't have any significant problems. So as long as the dressage rider can help this horse with the proper saddle, with the proper type of riding, make sure the lower limbs are not painful and the horse doesn't have to uh, move unevenly, even with those problems, a lot of times 
you cannot have to have veterinary therapy. It's the veterinary therapy is when you do have pain though. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so it's some questions on the neck, because again, this is, this is as a trainer and, and, you know, again, I have access to veterinarians like yourself who, who are great. And I can say like, I'm really having trouble riding this horse, you know, bending from the left and going to the right. For example, I can feel the horse struggle in his neck, you know, for example, and then I, I will take that information and, to, and give it to you and say, what's wrong. But when, when do you sort of involve your veterinarian you know, you're, you're riding your horse and let's say your horse is really stiff to the right. You know, when is Mm -hmm. a good time to sort of involve your vet as a general rule? Well, what I try to say is, um, first, most of my clients know about stretching of the neck and I haven't spoken about that yet, but, um, most of my clients know that if a horse has trouble bending to the right or turning the neck to the right, Um, And there's certain types of movements where the nose can turn or you can turn in the middle of the neck or the horse can reach around. If, If any of that clearly is compromised, then there's a problem. The other types of problem are is when you just simply groom your horse. When you groom the horse with a light touch or a soft brush or you wipe them off with a rag, is there neck pain associated anywhere around the muscles of that? The other, um, the other thing that is super um, cool to start learning about is, does your horse have any shoulder pain when you rub on it? Because I think a lot of shoulder pain is actually coming from the lower cervical area. So if you get your soft brush out or your curry comb or your, your, um, your rag and you start to rub on your horse and you touch his neck and he turns around to bite you, I would say that that's like, hey, there's, there's some neck pain here and, and then what am I supposed to do? If you if you can palpate or feel neck pain on your horse and it's legitimate, it's not a horse reacting to, you know, touching the vein or something they don't like, then you also have a riding issue of a performance riding issue, like I can't bend to the right. I think that's a signal to have your vet at least examine it. Um, and you can choose again, do you want to have, um, you know, the integrated medicine vet where you would get an evaluation based on acupuncture, chiropractic, um, or even just have your regular vet come and say, yeah, let's take x-rays and see what's there. If it's significant enough, it is challenging to, um, evaluate a neck during a lameness exam. Um, turning to the right is what I would call more a or to the left or any, any place is more a performance and you have to have the rider say, I can't do this. Um, certainly with all the components in the neck, it could be teeth, head, jaw, shoulders, feet, you know, you have to think of like, where is this actually coming from? And that's where the, the imaging comes in. So you've got, you've got to be a bit of a, a doctor detective and, uh, you know, investigate yeah. and get and get a lot of, uh, information, um, to help you to draw at least, you know, the, the most likely conclusion and work your way from there. I think that's, yeah. And it's, that's really challenging. It is, yeah. It's a doctor detective, but the fun part comes in is um, acupuncture and, and I'm promoting it myself because it's just wonderful to help do. Um, it wasn't meant to be a diagnostic tool, but it can give information as to where a lot of things come from. And an integrative practitioner or even your massage therapist, if, if um, you use a massage therapist on a regular basis, um, those, um, you know, technicians or, or therapists can help you to figure that out also. And uh, once you learn certain stretches with a horse and you learn the rotation or the flexion extension of each vertebra or each vertebral group, then you can almost do self-diagnostic tests and I can post videos of that. I have posted videos in the past on my Instagram of if your horse turns his head a certain way, then uh, if it turns up or down or to the side, that can give you like the, the cranial third of the neck is more involved or the middle third. And that can also help you learn to um, evaluate your own horse. Well, Dr. Holland, you always have the best information and, and I promised we'd only keep you 30 minutes because we can keep you for hours. So how can our listeners find you online? Okay, that's great. And and um, I love questions and comments. So I do have an Instagram page. It's Natural Vet PV. Uh, an Instagram also under my own name, Carol Holland DVM. And then Facebook, I have Carol Holland and DVM, which is um, Carol with an E. 
And that's usually the most, the easiest way to communicate with me. Um, you can send messages to my email at naturalvetpb um, at gmail.com. So um, I'd love to hear questions and comments. And if you uh, send pictures of your horse stretching, I think it's fun and we can all evaluate it together. So <laughs> thank it. you guys I, so I much. It. And this is my favorite thing to do is to talk about this because I think it's been overlooked for so many years. It has and been. It has fun. been. And it's it, it truly for riders now, it, it's it's something that has to be part of your program and it can really enhance for all the horses. So we thank you so much for, for talking with us and we can't wait to have you back on again. Have you ever wondered how to keep your horse sound and how to prevent future lameness issues? Have you had to deal with abscesses, stone bruises, laminitis, navicular or soft tissue damage in the hoof capsule? Or maybe you're a farrier and you want to learn how top vets around the world diagnose and treat various hoof care issues. The Humble Hoof is a podcast for both owners and professionals discussing the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Check us out, published twice a month on Horse Radio Network. Well, tonight we have a friend of ours back and he hasn't been on the show in way too long. And I saw him on the road the other day and asked him to come on. Lou Denizard from Delante Dressage. Lou, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Reese. It's been a while, but I, I love the show. I know. And we had such a great time with you last time. So I've been looking yeah. forward to our interview. So I was, I couldn't wait. And, and we were laughing because literally you drive by my farm in the morning to your farm and we <laughs> wave. And, yeah. and I literally did ask you over the fence if you would come back on the show. So I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a great tip for us today. Um, which we, I don't think over the years we've even talked about this, but kind of different ways to hold your reins. And I love this because again, I don't think this is something we've talked about maybe ever. Well, so I'm going to hand it to yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, what's important to me is that I think that the, you know, the, the, the masters used to use these rain techniques and I think they've just gotten a little bit neglected or forgotten. And I, I think they're important to keep around because they serve, serious purposes in the riding in order for the rider to know how to fix certain problems and, and, and use them correctly. And so the reins that I'm talking about are the Phyllis rain stance and um, the three in one rain stance. So let's start yeah, with, so let's start yeah. with, uh, with the Phyllis method. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can describe it and, you know, we can talk about its uses and, and you know, what, why, why use this method? Yeah, um, I remember that the Phyllis Rain was introduced to me by uh, the late Carl Makolka, and it's basically where you take the snaffle of the double bridle and you bring it in the top of your hand. Um, it comes in the top over your pointing finger, and then your curb comes in down in your normal holding the rein finger, and therefore they're separated by a good, oh, I mean, most hands are about three to four inches wide. So you hold that stance and uh, basically it's to single out the use and the communication between what you want from the Bredoon as opposed to what you want from the curb. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like you said, I mean, you know, this, you're not going to see it um, in any horse show, but it's important sometimes for the, for the training. So uh, talk about, you know, why do this, you know, or with what kind of horse that that might be useful. Yeah, sure. What I always find, um, and the thing is, it's not illegal to ride in it at a show. You can ride in it at a show, but it it almost has a stigma in a strange kind of way that nobody does it. So nobody wants to be the one brave enough to do it. Right. So um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I do it quite often in the warm up ring. Um, and my purpose for using it and what I've always been taught about it is that it, it, by isolating the reins out like that, you change the balance of the horse. So it opens up the frame and it uh, brings the balance more into an uphill position so that you don't get stuck in that overflexed and then a little bit on the forehand or in the hand or too heavy. And it's a wonderful rein for, for doing that. Then you have a wider set of reins on either side of the neck and shoulders to be able to control the horse's straightness, uh, steering. And I find that extremely helpful and useful. I've always used it for, it's sometimes the horse is really strong. Yes. Sometimes you can, you can we flip the rein over and like you right. said, it's not illegal. You can, you can do it. And, and it yeah. just is a different feeling to the horse. Absolutely. And, 
for me, I, I actually have really small hands. So yeah. sometimes that helps me hold the reins a little, little stronger if I need Excellent. a little bit more grip. Yeah. So, and, yeah. but it, uh, it does help a lot. Some mm-hmm. horses love it and it's really right. effective. Right. Um, so I think that for me, because of the size of my hands, which are weirdly small, um, that, that does help. So it is, it is a tool and I've done it also in the snaffle. You can do it that oh, way. Oh yeah, well, absolutely. Right? Well, well, you know, what What I find is, you know, people that have been kind of hounded to keep their hands down and then suddenly the hand pressure is always pulling down, they tend to be riders that end up using the bottom of the forearm and the bicep too much. So I change their rein stance so that they end up holding the Phyllis rein either in the snaffle or in the double so that they then use the upper forearm and the tricep more correctly and more of a direct line. Yeah, what I was going to say is that we already know that you can change the angles of the bits in the horse's mouth by lifting your hand up or down, you know, right. uh, a, you know, a few inches. But here you can you can hold your arm and hand and whatever in, in a nice, um, comfortable position, but but lift that rein you know, uh, uh, three inches maybe, or, you know, however big your hand is. Yeah, it's, and, it, I think it's, it's a, it's kind of a wrist flexion that lifts the, the rain that's coming in the top. So you don't actually have to carry your hands because, you know, a lot of us get caught up and, you know, trying to lift the horse and suddenly our hands yeah, are too high yeah, and yeah, don't belong yeah. there, you know, so then you yeah. get to put your hands down. And mm-hmm. so it's a really good way to find how is it that you change the balance without all that raising of your hand all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, for our listeners, if if you have a horse that is, you know, that bears down onto the bit and I mean, you physically, you know, with, with, you know, you can use a lot of strength, but you physically can't lift a horse's head and neck and shoulders with just, you know, like, oh, you know, know, just just change the angle of the, the rein to the bit. And that changes the feeling of the bit into the horse's mouth. And that can be a, a super useful kind tool. Yes, Um, I agree. Yeah, help you much write. kinder. Yeah, yeah yes. much kinder. And then what I tell everybody is, is that that when you, especially if I do it in the snaffle, which I also do, uh, Reese, just like you do, yeah. I, I will yeah. do that with the snaffle. I find that it's a more, it's a stronger rein to the horse. Like they listen more clearly to it, but it's a weaker rein to the rider. So the rider feels a little bit out of water uh, because it's a different set of muscle groups that you're using that, but it's actually much more clear to the horse of what it is you're looking for. So it's a, it's a intriguing and uh, fun way to kind of figure out hand and strength balance. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's really something you should try and, yeah. and get, in the horse that I specifically did it on, we would switch it around. Yes. You know, I, we would switch the rein yes. and, and, and it would, it, it would change the balance just enough that he would pay attention a little bit. And Absolutely. then I could flip my hand back over and, yeah. um, it, it's a really cool technique and, and really something yeah. to explore, you know, just, just in the winter, play with it a little bit and, and sure. see if, if that works. So I love that one. So you have another one for us. I do. I do. The other one is three in one, which is where you, hand yourself uh, in one of your hands, and this is mostly in the double, um, you know, not so much in the snaffle because you only got two reins, but in the double bridle, you hand yourself the curb over to one of your hands, most of the time to the outside hand. So you'll hand yourself the curb so that you have now have three reins in the outside hand, and then you have the freedom to use the snaffle by itself on the inside hand. And that's called three in one. And I say that it's mostly in the outside hand, but you can also do it to the inside hand. Depends on what you're looking for from the separation of the curb from the, you know, Badoon in your inside or outside hand. What is your purpose? And my my big feeling on that is that um, the snaffle, when combined with the curb, if you try to supple the horse with the curb and the snaffles, uh, curbs are not for suppling. So then sometimes the horse gets a little bit defensive about how the curb engages when you're trying to work through that. So I will separate that so that that way my snaffle is free and I can touch uh, e- easier on the horse. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's why it's mostly with the outside. You know, you, you put mostly, most of the reins in the right. outside because you're kind of, if you're preparing for, let's uh, let's imagine you're preparing for a 10 meter circle, you're suppling Absolutely. to the inside or you're preparing for a half pass. I mean, most of the moves are being, are, are suppling 
you know, a corner, you know, all these, a turn, you know, all these things are suppling to the inside. So that's why it would mostly be, um, you know, putting the, the, the curb reins into your outside rein. But, you know, uh, it can be, it can be helpful, um, if you come up the center line or you're coming up quarter lines. Oh, and absolutely. Just, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then just like, um, you know, I've got horses that are, you know, hollow to the left and I've got a few other horses that are hollow to the right. So right. You, you, you would be focusing on whatever their hollow side is with the, with the one snaffle rein and whatever their, their, um, you know, steadier side is on, on the other one. So perfectly said, I agree with you hundred percent there. I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, I try to make the riders and fit, like understand that in having the curb in the other hand, that you have a triangle that's going from the curb to the two outside reins and that you can use that triangle to either straighten a horse, bend a horse, whatever it is you, you need from that rein set. And then your snaffle is reacting to what you need position or bend or whatever it is you're trying to, to work through. Of course, you know, paying attention to the rest of your body with legs and seat. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause it's, it's just one of those things, again, a great technique. If you're having a bit of an issue with the bend, it's great. Right. It, and when you say, Oh, you know, like you said, the 10 meter circle, for example, sometimes you take that curb away and put it where you have a little bit different feeling. Uh, yes. It's not necessarily power, it just changes, right. changes the horse's feeling. Sometimes they really like that. So Absolutely. sometimes, you know, really sensitive horses or not so sensitive horses. I've had it work with right. not so sensitive horses too. Cause they're like, Whoa, yeah. what just happened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It was different. laughs> wait a minute. Pay, yeah. yeah. Whoa. Wait a minute. Yeah. No, well, I mean, I if it. you're, if you're looking to fix, I mean, I say this all the time, but if you're looking to fix a problem, if you continue to do it the same way and it's not getting yeah. fixed, you, these are some techniques in which to, you know, be creative and to sort of change the feeling in the horse's mouth of, uh, of the bits. If you've got a problem, you know, you say you could do this with a double, but it's a nice, a nice thing to, to try to ride in the snaffle with one hand that can, it can draw your attention to so many, you know, so many problems that you, you might have with, with straightness. Um, yeah, good, good point. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. So just, yeah. just switching things up and, and being creative. We try to give people ideas uh, on this show on how to, uh, you know, how to switch it up, especially during the winter. I mean, I'm stuck up here in Canada, so I'm looking for things to do and, and, and how to, you know, evaluate problems or, or, or look for a problem that I didn't know existed and, and that yeah, kind sure. of stuff. It's super fun. <clears throat> Yeah. I also think I also think it's a great way, and again, the, the, this is like like being up there stuck in the winter time to teach yourself how to learn to change your reins in your hands without getting discombobulated and not being able to continue to ride. So I, I sometimes find that my that's a great point. You know, yeah. my, my riders hold on so strongly to one spot on the rein, and I'm like, no, oh, your hand has to figure out. When do you let go of the curb a little bit? When do you shorten shorten what's in your hands? You know, when, how do you change to adjust to the moment that's being offered to you in the work? You know, yeah. so yeah, really Terrific. important. Yeah. Lou, I have yeah. one other one other one. It just came to mind. How about sure. bridging your reins? Oh, all the bridging. time on my baby. Yep. Oh, on yep. my young horses forever. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's my it's <laughs> yeah, my talk safety. About that. <laughs> well, how do you, you, know, how do you bridge reins? If you were talking about bridging the reins, how do you do that? Sure. Well, that, that can be done in the snaffle. You could also do it in a double. I would assume I, I don't think that I've done that, but maybe I'll have to practice that. But uh, <laughs> If you need in breaks, the, yeah, you'll do it. Yeah. In, in the snaffle, what basically you feed your inside rein or your outside rein to the other hand, and you create a connection between the inside and the outside hand, then that's what is considered the bridge. The rein is connected closer it's a shorter distance from inside hand to outside hand and i mean i remember my eventing days having to use it to not get run off with on cross country and (laughs) i do i do it also to be able to contain the young horse from dodging too much left and right um it's a a wonderful rain to to do so and then it teaches your hands to work a little bit in unison yeah 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 again it's great for young horses 
It can Absolutely. be used a lot for that. Or or if you're getting taken off with, that's a good one yeah. to try. Yeah. <laughs> Just hopefully you're not, but you know, yeah. you, can, you can be a little stronger. It happens. Yes, it happens. It happens. I love it. Well, Lou, this is such, it's been such a great discussion. Um, and like you said, some of these old techniques, we can't forget them. Uh, they were there for a reason and, and the old masters sure. used them. So I'm, I'm yeah. so glad you brought that to our attention. And um, if our listeners have any more questions, how can they find you online? Um, they can find me online at uh, dressagedelante.com. Um, and um, they are welcome to come by and visit. I'm at uh, Kim Jackson's Mayfair Oaks in White Fences. That's where my business runs out of. Um, and also they're welcome to walk up to me wherever they see me and ask away. I'm always willing to answer questions. Yeah, you're the best. I love it. Oh. And always willing to wave in the morning. I, I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lou. And we look forward to having you on again. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Phil. We really, truly get asked. I get asked probably once a week, do the stability <laughs> stirrup leathers really help you? And my answer is always yes. It's so cute. My my landlady, um, yesterday, she she's so cute, and she came out, and she goes, oh, my gosh, are those the stability stirrup leathers? And I said, they are. And she's like, seriously, do they really work? And I was like, oh, yeah, they really work. <laughs> and they're worth your investment and your, if you're, and she said, oh, I need to buy new stirrup leathers. And I said, for sure, purchase these because, um, I think they help my leg tremendously. Whenever I don't have them on a saddle, I'm always wishing I did. And, uh, they're just, they're very, very helpful, very durable. And I do think they stabilize your leg. And I literally have all the things. Cause I figure if I have all the things, the sum of all parts will really help. So <laughs> that's my theory. We, we we go on about it every week and every week we we promote these products from total saddle fit because we really do believe in them and use them and ride them so um i think the the current promotion is that you can you can order them try them you don't like them and send them back and i think they'll pay shipping both ways wow so you just go ahead check them out on on the website it's totalsaddlefit.com and you know, if you do order them, you will not be returning them because we love them. We love them. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, for this week's Total Saddle Fit Tip of the Week, we have FEI rider, trainer, and blogger extraordinaire, Lauren Spreiser. Welcome, Lauren. Hello, Philip and Reese. Well, tell us. We actually don't know the tip. We like to do this sometimes. It keeps it interesting for us. What is your trainer tip of the week? My trainer tip of the week is this. Make sure your knees are bent. My first riding instructor is a has become a biomechanics person and she did an amazing clinic for us uh in virginia at my farm in the fall and she's actually here again this weekend as we are recording this and she taught some really really cool different approaches to thinking about rider seat and rider position but the biggest one she gave to me was make sure your students are bending their knees and sure enough she's right i have so many students that are just a little bit straight in their leg, just a little bit too much mass in their stirrup irons. And that's a chain reaction that pushes the stirrup iron down into the stirrup bar, which pushes this tree of the saddle down to the horse's back, as well as makes your leg and your seat more like bone on bone instead of muscle on muscle. And so think about squeezing a grapefruit behind your knee. That's going to make sure that you're not shoving too much mass down into your stirrup irons and instead keeping your mass in your bum and in your legs. And it also is going to make sure that you have this dynamic chain between pushing energy from the hindquarters of the horse forward from your hamstring and then pulling that energy up through your quadricep up into the horse's withers. That is a great tip. I think... Uh, you know, I was certainly a victim of this maybe early on in my riding, whatever, you know, that um, we have been told that, you know, the the dressage rider has a long leg, you know, so we're just constantly just trying to get the leg longer, trying to get the leg longer. But but actually, you know, there, there becomes a point where it becomes, you know, too long and ineffectual. And, uh, you know, the, the joints 
the joints in your, you know, your leg, your knee, your, your ankle should all be flexed in, in which to, like you said, absorb the motion and to generate a bit of spring to go with the horse. Um, I don't know how, how else to, to describe it, but you know, when you, you know, and you did a good job too. And it's just like, you know, if you're driving your knee very straight, it, that spring action doesn't happen whether you're rising or, or sitting. So, um, you know, sit, sit on your butt and, and make sure that your, your leg, your hip and, and knee is, is being effectual in, uh, in driving and catching the energy of the horse. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, the only thing I was going to add is I, I like the the thought that your lower leg takes is creating energy behind your seat is pushing the energy forward and your shoulder blades and your upper body are taking care of the front of the horse. So that was going to be what I added to that because it's the same concept, right? Is if you push everything down, that doesn't work for any type of flow or energy. So I love it. So Lauren, one more time, give us a quick grapefruit behind your knee, right? Squeeze that grapefruit behind your knee so that you can use your hamstring to create energy. And then your quadricep draws it up through the horse's wither and you recycle it. Drive it forward, suck it up into the air. Drive it forward, suck it up into the air. You can't do that if your knee is straight out in front of you and you're mashing down in your stirrups like an ex-boyfriend's face is underneath your toes. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to forget that one. Awesome. Well, Lauren, how can our listeners find you online if they want to hear any more uh, fantastic tips that you have? I am here for all of your horse training and relationship advice on all of the socials at Lauren Spreiser, as well as on my website, spreisersporthorse.com. Well, as always, we love email and Facebook shout outs. They make our day and I truly, um, it just makes me smile when somebody asks a question or tells us uh, what they think about the show. Hopefully it's good stuff. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh, we love it. So we love participation. It really, it, it makes it, uh, then Phil and I know what you guys want. So we like that. And if you guys like our show or anything else on the Horse Radio Network, you should probably join the auditor program. You can do that by going to thehorseradionetwork.com and clicking on the link to tell you exactly how to do that. Well, we always love all the participation and all the love for, from the whole network as well. As always, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. I think the best way to find me is probably through Facebook or my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. Like our thank our sponsors for allowing us to put on a good show. That's Kentucky Performance Products and Total Saddle Fit. Don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we look forward to talking with you next week. Thank you.